Um, welcome to the sixth webinar in our 2024 series. Uh, my name is Rob Bertels. I'm a co-creator of the Online Help Center for the BC Small Water Systems um, website. And I'm also uh, a teacher at the uh, Water and Wastewater Technology Program at TRU. Um, before we begin, I wanted to uh, make an acknowledgement here that Thompson Rivers University campuses are on the traditional lands of the Tecumlips Tessequapam, which is the Kamloops campus, and the Tehulk Williams Lake campus in the Sequapam Kuluk, the traditional and unceded territory of the Sequapam. Just as a little bit of background, uh, Thompson Rivers University, with their partner hosts, uh, an annual webinar series and courses uh, dedicated to provide technical information, resources, and tools to small water system owners and operators and Indigenous small water systems on issues of treatment, regulation, operations, maintenance, and water quality monitoring. The Online Health Centre strives to assist small water systems in BC uh, to implement a multi-barrier approach to drinking water in order for systems to consistently provide safe, potable drinking water in their communities in compliance with government regulations. The webinars are scheduled every two months in 2024 and is offered free of charge for attendees uh, who are and is offered for free of charge for attendees who are EOCP certified. Um, each webinar will count as 0.1 CEUs towards your certification. A certificate of completion will be issued um, to the webinar participants, um, which then can be submitted to the EOCP. And uh, we'll have our one hour presentation first, followed by half an hour questions. During this duration of the presentation, if any questions arise, please jot them down in the questions section and we will try and address your question after the presentation. Today, our presentation is focused on the importance of drought specific emergency response planning. Emergency response and contingency, plan contingency plans are required by legislation for permanent drinking water systems. This presentation will go over uh, key things to consider when developing or revisiting your ERCP for drought. Um, considerations for how mitigation and, imp and impacts of drought and building system resilience will also be discussed. Our presenter today is Nancy Clements. Nancy is a um, regional healthy built environment uh, for the North and Central Island, Vancouver Island, uh, with a degree in environmental public health and a minor in public administration. She is a certified public health inspector with 27 years of experience working in BC and Ontario. Most recently, her work is focused on supporting environmental health officers and local governments around the healthy built environment and the impacts of climate change on health. She stays true to her environmental public health roots, advocating for sustainable land development, um, for water and wastewater, and uh, resilient building and sorry and resilient buildings. She works collaboratively, collaboratively alongside interior uh, sorry island health medical health officers in partnership with local governments, um, academics, and provincial government ministries. She is passionate about ensuring the safety of public health, and now uh, and, and uh, she, we now uh, see her plans for the future. Okay, so Nancy, I'm going to give you presenter mode, and you can take it away. Sounds good. All right. All right, so just checking, everybody can see my slides. Yes. Sounds great. So thanks, Rob. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to present today to talk about the importance of drought-specific emergency response planning. Um, and just really appreciate the opportunity to share the work that we've been doing within the Island Health Region. And uh, my goal really at the end of the day is, is to try to provide that little bit of extra help or you know give you a little bit of insight or some things that maybe you hadn't considered. Uh, to make sure that that you have a plan and that it's a robust plan that's that's going to help you move into the future as as our climate continues to change and we we face those challenges and impacts 
So I also want to uh, acknowledge that within the Island Health Region, um, we are on the traditional and ceded territories of the Coast Salish, the Nuchalnath, and the Kwakwakaewak uh, peoples, as well as six Métis charter communities, and just very grateful to have the opportunity to, to live in this wonderful place. <clears throat> so for the agenda today, I'm just uh, going to speak uh, briefly to the overview of drought. So what brought us to that work, uh, the step-by-step -step planning process with some examples, and just touch lightly on some resilience building for drinking water systems. So what are some things and uh, that you could do to try to build resilience moving forward? So why focus on drought? Within um, Island Health, uh, we did have small pockets of areas that, that had drought in the past, uh, but it, they tended to be small areas. It tended to be, you know, short-term events. Uh, and then 2021 hit, and uh, everybody probably very fondly remembers the extreme heat that we suffered from in the heat dome, and then the, the, the continued heat all summer long. Uh, so we we started asking those questions. Uh, how were our drinking water operators doing? Were they able to continue to supply uh, drinking water to all their users, given the, the extreme heat and the lack of rain that we were seeing? At that time, we, we did a survey uh, out to our permitted drinking water systems. And at that time, the information that we got back was about 16% of our systems um, had exp were experiencing some form of water shortage. And at that time, just over 50% of the, those respondents indicated that they had a plan for water loss. So we looked at that data again, uh, and we re repeated the survey in 2022. Um, at that time, we saw that uh, about 55% of our water system users had their water usage measured. So it could be a very rudimentary measure. It, it could have been very, you know, robust and complex uh, methodology, but they, they had some means of measuring how much water they were, were using. Um, we also have 77% of our systems rely on groundwater. So that's a lot of our water systems can't see the, the water that they're pulling. 53% had emergency response and contingency plans for water loss. But what we drilled down in our second survey was uh, that plan for water loss was really linked to that short-term event. So if there was a broken water main or a pump failure and they were down for a couple of days, their plans included how they would respond to that. Um, but it didn't really speak to sort of the long-term uh, loss of source that we typically see with a drought event. Uh, we also discovered that there was a, a fair lack of public source data on many of the aquifers, uh, so people weren't able to get some of that information. During that survey, I also included a free text box just to get feedback directly from the operators. And, and the one response that really spoke to me really loudly was, I would feel more comfortable about drought preparedness if I knew the state of the aquifer. So really highlighting the the disconnection between being able to act because you know that, that there, the aquifer is being challenged, but not even having that baseline knowledge. Uh, they didn't know how to respond. So why is it important to have an emergency response and contingency plan specific to drought? So we consider no water to be a health hazard under the Public Health Act. So obviously, uh, as drinking water operators, you are required under the Act and the regulation to supply potable water. So supply being the key part of that. So the lack of that supply is a significant public health concern. It's also important to know and understand the risks that your water system faces and, and drought is now becoming a very real risk for more and more drinking water systems. It's also uh, very important to include the public in these conversations. Uh, so you get better public participation in those conservation efforts if they're part of the conversation in that planning process. And as well, it can help identify where those gaps are so that you can uh, flag those gaps and look at sort of long and mid and long term um, planning to try to address and fill in some of those gaps. 
So that planning for loss of source, um, many, as I said, many of those plans did have loss of source identified as a risk, but it might not be enough. So being able to ensure the longevity of that system was sort of the key gap that was identified. So drought is different than other losses of source because of the tendency of droughts to be very widespread. So we would see, uh, you know, a large number of water systems impacted by it. And as well, the duration of that tends to be much longer. It's not just a quick fix or a repair and then you're back up and running. It's a continued loss of source for an unknown period of time. So it's really important to plan for that monitoring of those supply levels. So understanding how much you have and ensuring that you know, you're know you conserving when you need to. Um, understanding what levels trigger different levels of response. So as you are monitoring and as the source may be starting to deplete, what's the level of response related to that level of depletion or risk? And what is your response if you ever encounter a complete loss of source, which uh, is obviously what we're trying to avoid. <clears throat> so it's really important in, in the part in the planning is building that resilience because that resilience can help you avoid that emergency in the first place. So understanding what those risks are helps you plan moving into the future. And that's not to say that those plannings are things that can be done in, you know, a very short period of time. It might be, a, you know, a multi-year project, but, you know, flagging it that that's sort of a gap or a deficiency is an important part of the process. So for an adequate drought response, you have to see it coming. So droughts are different than a lot of our other sort of natural disasters and challenges that we're seeing with the impacts of climate change. You know, we're lining up for a slight cyclone bomb here on the island. So, you know, we're anticipating high, wind, high winds and a lot of rain uh, coming in the next uh, day and a half. So, uh, you know, it's sort of a one-time event. It comes and then it goes and then, you know, we clean up afterwards. Drought is a long, slow, progressive event. So it's important to be monitoring ahead of that so that you see that you're starting to have that dwindling supply. And that allows you to plan and have an adequate response. So in creating an emergency response and contingency plan, the plan has to include a few key pieces. So you want to include that this, what the steps are to follow in the event of an emergency or an abnormal operation circumstance. Now, every water system is a little bit different. We've got very large systems, we've got very small systems, uh, you know, any multiplicity of numbers of, of users. Uh, so it's really important that it be very specific uh, to your drinking water system. It needs to include that contact information. So all that internal system contact information, the health authority, and any other um, agencies that need to be informed of any of these challenges. And it has to be accessible to staff, the drinking water officer, and the public. And I, I say limited to the public. I mean, you don't want to be, you know, providing, you know, sensitive information out on a public platform, but you want the public to know that such a plan exists, that the system is prepared for, uh, you know, to respond to that type of an event. So I always like to add the little caveat that there are uh, limitations to templates. So at Island Health, we created a template for our small and very small drinking water systems. And um, we wanted to, to try to uh, support the water system operators in, in developing that plan. And so what we tried to do is uh, highlight sort of those key uh, pieces that needed to be considered as part of that planning process. But uh, as we all know, one size does not fit all. So you need to be cognizant of that and make sure that the plan um, needs to be very specific to your system. So there's components within that template uh, which may not apply to your system. So obviously that part would be left blank as it's not applicable. So today we're gonna to be discussing the drought response component of the ERCP only. Uh, this would be something that you could add on to an existing emergency response and contingency plan. 
and because it's considered a, an add-on piece to uh, your existing plan, it doesn't include any of that contact information that I mentioned previously. So that all that contact information should already uh, live within the main part of your plan. Uh, if you don't already have an emergency response plan, I would strongly encourage you to, to work on that as well. Uh, but you'll see within that template, uh, it doesn't have that contact information. And this is uh, not a fill in the blank document. So um, it, there, there is supplemental information that needs to be added for this to be complete and robust. Uh, so it, it we, you know, we tried to maintain it at a two page front and back uh, template with some fields that you can populate, uh, but there is additional information that would need to be developed and attached to that in order to make sure that that plan is, is fully robust and complete. So uh, sorry that this is kind of a small slide, but just to give you a, a quick high level view. Uh, so this is the template that we developed uh, to support our small water systems with the development of their drought specific response plan. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just walk us through sort of all these different sections and just touch on what sort of information we would be looking for in there. Uh, this is available on our Island Health webpage. Uh, anybody is welcome to access that or even just use it as sort of a guide of, of what sort of information to consider when developing your own plan. So with the preliminary planning exercise, uh, you know, this is some high level planning that you should do. And this is, again, this is some of this extra information that you would want to develop and have sort of attached to the plan. So within your water system, you know, you need to create a list of who the priority users of that water system are. So in times of significant scarcity, if you need to start allocating who gets that limited resource, it's really beneficial to have that figured out ahead of time. So obviously, you know, residential use uh, would be a higher priority over industrial use uh, because people need water to survive. Uh, if, if push comes to shove, uh, where do your priorities lie? Um, the other thing, and a lot of uh, systems might already have this within their water restriction bylaws or recommendations, is a list of acceptable uses for that water supply. So, you know, as, as that supply starts to dwindle, what activities are no longer really advisable or are should completely stop. So, you know, we want to maintain that water supply for that human consumption and human health need versus car washing. So making sure that you very clearly communicate sort of what's acceptable and what's not makes it a lot easier for people to, to follow, you know, through and make sure that there's clear communications on those expectations. The other piece uh, that often gets missed is that communication piece. So, you know, we encourage uh, water system operators to have those communications uh, already developed. So have some of that baseline messaging already developed so that, you know, as the scarcity or as an emergency comes up, you've already got that language framed out. You can just put a date on it and it's ready to go out the door. You're not in that emergent situation and then trying to develop, you know, the messaging to to uh, send out to your users. So, you know, having some of that template developed ahead of time is really beneficial. It'll save you a lot of hassle, you know, when things are a little more uh, chaotic and, and busy for you. So going back to that discussion around determining priority users and the reduction of service, these are really awkward and difficult conversations. Obviously, it's a lot easier to have that kind of conversation on a rainy day in November when it's not an emergency. And it's there's no cookie cutter, right answer, wrong answer. It really is reflective of uh, what the community values, who the users are on your system. Um, so, and it, it might be something that takes time and, and needs to evolve. Uh, it may not be something that can be settled in, in one afternoon. So it's, but a very important and valuable conversation to have with those users in your system. Obviously, if all the connections you have are residential, um, that is 
pretty easy to identify that they're all priority for their domestic use, then it comes down to the conversation about what's appropriate use of that water. So that's where you're looking at those uh, water use restrictions for garden watering and car washing and, and things like that. So it's really important to understand who's on your system and how they're using waters, water in, and in what way. And the other thing that I always like to flag as well, because I know it came up as an issue in our community, is, is understanding the balance of water use against social and mental health benefits. So things like in extreme heat when, you know, people can't be watering their lawns or filling up, you know, swimming pool, backyard swimming pools, you know, perhaps it's really valuable and important to keep those community splash pads open during those times to give people a, a place to go to cool off, you know, to continue to socialize. Um, so that's just an example of how, you know, some people might view that as being wasteful, whereas, you know, if you measure that against the social and mental uh, benefits, it's, it's very valuable. So, you know, those are discussions to continue to have within the community. Obviously, engaging the water users in that process is key, um, because if you're, uh, you know, you'll get much better buy-in from from the community if they've been part of the process and that they understand the challenges that you're facing as the water operator. And as I said, always better to have these conversations uh, on a rainy day in, in, in November than in the middle of an emergency. So uh, the next section within that plan is to identify supplemental or alternative sources of potable water. So again, uh, one size does not fit all. So this may or may not uh, work for your water system. So if it's not applicable, then obviously it's, it would, you wouldn't need to populate that. But just some things to think about, you know, what are the alternative sources that you may have access to at your water system? So perhaps you have a well that's not currently in use or you have a water license into a surface water supply that's not currently active. Uh, is that an option to bring online? So uh, I can collectively hear all the health inspectors gasping. Please, please, please don't just drop a pipe in a creek and start pulling water. Please talk to your uh, drinking water officer ahead of time because there's all sorts of um, testing and approval that needs to happen beforehand. But um, uh, it, it's valuable effort to identify if there are some of those alternative sources that uh, you might be able to add that to your existing supply to supplement what you currently have. Uh, if you don't have a reservoir with on your drinking water system, uh, you know the bulk water hauler will have nowhere to put water if they start trucking in water. So, is there a, a company in you, nearby that would rent out? Uh, potable water reservoir for short periods of time. So looking at uh, who locally might provide that service. Um, and obviously uh, the bulk hauled water, uh, you know, I always encourage people to have more than one uh, hauler on their list uh, because if uh, your system's running out of water, chances are all the neighboring systems are also struggling as well. So there'll be high demand on that service. So the other option to consider, and again, this really depends on where you're located relative to other water systems. If there's a neighboring water supply that is, is quite close to your system, is there an opportunity to interconnect those two systems? Again, you need to have this well planned out ahead of time in consultation with the drinking water officer to make sure that, that there's no uh, legislative requirements that you need to satisfy first, but you know if there's an emergency and you need to interconnect into another system, is that an option for you? Or perhaps you're quite isolated and that's not even something you could consider. And then sort of last option is bottled water. So for short periods of time, you can supply bottled water, although that tends to be very, very expensive. So you know long term, that's that's not really a sustainable option. So with emergent issue planning, so we kind of looked at this as two phases. So, you, you know, phase one being, you know, your system's not out of water yet, but there's significantly reduced water availability. So, and then the other section is, yeah, wow, we're completely out of water. So with that uh, reduced water availability, what you want to be able to do within your system is identify those trigger points 
uh, to establish levels of response. So as the diminishing, you know, you see that source water level diminishing, perhaps you're noticing turbidity issues, you know, in a groundwater supply or a surface water supply. Uh, and things like if you're unable to maintain that reservoir level. So for water operators that know their system really well, they'll be like, man, that reservoir should be filled by now, but it's still pumping away. So you know that you're, you're starting to run out of water. Um, if you have the capacity to measure your aquifer levels, if you notice that the aquifer levels are starting to drop, obviously that's another potential trigger point. But it's really important that you have to see it coming. So establish some method of measuring your source water availability. So obviously with surface water, it's, it's a lot easier because you can see it. Uh, if you're withdrawing uh, from a lake, you can see where the normal shoreline water level sits, um, although it's much more challenging with groundwater supplies. Um, there are provincial monitoring wells, which that information is publicly available. Um, if you're fortunate enough to have one of those nearby, you can use that as a, a one of a piece of information in, in determining where potentially your source water is sitting. If you have an aquifer monitor in your own reservoir or in your own uh, well, that is really valuable information. Uh, but you can also look at other system changes. So like, as I mentioned before, you know, perhaps it's taking longer to refill that reservoir. Um, it's really important to think through some of those, ve be very specific and measurable trigger points. And at each of those uh, trigger points, what's the response that you're gonna take? So as the supply becomes more challenged, you're ramping up your response in conservation uh, to tr try to buffer and extend the availability of that water. So we also encourage uh, monitoring your storage capacity. So, um, you know, obviously there's uh, natural reservoirs uh, and then we have our man-made storage tanks. So, you know, you want to look at what uh, the capacity is and how long that capacity will last you and how long it takes for that to recharge. So um, again, one of the limitations of trying to keep the form to, to two pages is we only made this section two lines. Well, obviously you want to be monitoring your reservoir a little more robustly than twice. Um, so this just gives you an idea of some of the information that you would want to be checking on and uh, you know that you would keep that as a separate uh, set of documentation. But you, you want to have a good understanding of you know, what, what the volume is, your current usage and what's the capacity. So how long would that amount last you? And sort of monitor that over time because obviously uh, you know, demand will fluctuate and you want to make sure that you know, the, those conservation efforts that you're making uh, are actually being followed. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of communications and, and making sure that you clearly communicate to the users what's going on and what the expectations of, of the users are. Um, and so when you consider implementing water restrictions and conservation measures, and you want to make sure you communicate those clearly out to the users. Uh, there's also a requirement to notify your drinking water officer of any potential threat to the water uh, that might affect the supply or the potability. So if you are noticing that your source water is, is starting to get depleted, um, it's probably a good idea just to flag that to the drinking water officer so that they know that uh, you're, you're starting to run out of water and you, know, you can discuss with uh, your drinking water officer what your plan is and sort of what the actions you're taking. It just keeps them in the loop and that then they can um, you know, make sure that they can support you in any additional ways. Uh, and then there may be a requirement to notify any other applicable agencies. So uh, if there's licensing issues, uh, if you're really running out of uh, water, obviously, you know, reaching out to EMCR might be applicable, uh, but just making sure that you know who are the people that you need to communicate relative to, to your water system. 
So uh, the next step would be if it does develop into a critical issue. So obviously this is an emergency. Um, you know, you have that lack of water to be, meet that basic health and sanitation needs of, the, of your users. And there's also significant issues with it, uh, the infrastructure itself. There could be back pressure into the system, which could lead to a lot of contamination issues and a loss of fire protection capacity. Um, and obviously, if it does get a significant depletion or loss of source, there's also significant impacts to uh, business. So there could be some significant business loss as well. So uh, with emergency communications, uh, three key things. Yeah, I touched on this already, but you know, making sure that you update those communications to the users. So, you know, if you have uh, some kind of social media page that you use, or if there's some other notification methodology that you use, make sure you, you keep those, uh, the users updated uh, because they'll be looking for information. So having the ability to provide them with those updates is really, really important. Uh, obviously loss of source, you do need to notify your drinking water officer because that is a threat. Uh, and as well, any other applicable agencies. So what you want to do is create operational instructions. So this again, will be very specific to the design of your water system and uh, you will need to have it attached as a, an additional list of what actions you need to take if, you, if your source runs out of water. So again, this is uh, just an example. Um, uh, we pulled together and it may or may not be applicable to your water system. So obviously, uh, if if the source is, is run out, you need to shut off the pump. Uh, you may need to issue a boil water notice in conjunction with conversations with the drinking water officer. You know, have procedures to bring um, unused water supplies online. So if you've gone through the process of, of looking at and identifying, you know, backup water supplies, you know, what, what are the procedures to follow to bring those online? Uh, perhaps you need to close the inlet to the reservoir or to temporarily close some of those businesses or, you know, the water system itself. So, you know, obviously it's going to be very specific to your water system. So you, you almost want to have almost like a checklist. Here's what you need to do. Um, a lot of times with small water systems, there may only be one or two people that, that operate that system. and you know, there might be somebody who's done it for years and years and they know that system inside out, upside down and backwards. And it's all that sort of historic operator knowledge. Um, please write it down because I guarantee uh, the week you're on holidays is the week your backup operator is going to have to deal with this issue because that always <laughs> seems to be how it works. So making sure that there's a very clear list so that anybody can pick it up and, and run with that list is, is really, really important. So once your plan is complete, um, as I mentioned earlier on, you should have your full and complete emergency response and contingency plan already developed. And this would be an addendum to, so an add-on. Um, we, in our region, uh, wanted those plans done uh, fairly quickly. So obviously, if, if your system's at a high risk of drought, if you've suffered uh, water loss in the past, uh, it's definitely something that should be addressed within your emergency response plan. And, you know, contact your drinking water officer. I mean, each health authority is a little bit different in their processes and expectations. Um, you know, you want to make sure that if, if, it's, uh, if it needs to be reviewed by the drinking water officer, that you get that in front of your DWO so that they can review it and provide you some comments and feedback and make sure that they know that you're, you're prepared to address that risk. So test your plan. Written plans are a really great first step, but they need to be tested to identify any gaps or potential issues before there's an actual uh, true emergency. And the example I use is, you know, I had a water system that I was inspecting and they had four reservoirs, four beautiful reservoirs, and they were up on a rock bluff. And, uh, you know, he handed me his plan and he said, oh, well, if we, if we run out of water, we'll, we'll just get the water hauler to fill up our reservoirs. Well, this was a water system located about 45 minutes up a forest service road. 
Uh, and these reservoirs were up on this rock bluff that had a driveway, let's say. Um, but it was it was quite sketchy. And I said, will the water hauler even come out here? And didn't know. And I said, there's no way that hauler's getting his, his rig up that hill. Does he have a hose long enough to get up there? Does he have a pump? Because a lot of them operate on gravity. So he looked at me and he's like, I don't know. So understanding like, yeah, he filled in the, 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 the blanks on the form that we had given him, but it wasn't thought through. So looking at how could you actually test that plan, um, you know, through a tabletop exercise or, you know, just some of that critical thinking uh, to identify, you know, yeah, I'll call a water hauler. Well, what hauler? And do they service this area? And, and what requirements are there for that unit to operate effectively? So, you know, understanding and testing that is, is really important. And that goes for all aspects of your ERCP, not just for the drug component piece. So uh, there's also the requirement to review your plans. So your plans need to be kept up to date and they are the expectation is that they be reviewed and updated annually or as needed. So, um, you know, things that typically need to be updated is, you know, those contacts, uh, you know, especially now there's a lot of turnover with drinking water officers. So perhaps you have a different uh, DWO. You could have internal staffing changes. There could be changes to the infrastructure. Perhaps you've added on to your water system. Uh, sometimes we see additions or changes in their source water supply. And as well, if you're subject to local bylaws, perhaps some of those bylaws uh, have impacted uh, what that response might look like. So it's important to just take a look at that plan once a year and make sure that it's accurate and, and up to date. <clears throat> so moving forward, you know, the reality is drought is here to stay and it's impacting different areas in different ways. And there's definitely areas that are much more uh, prepared to address drought than others. Um, but there, there needs to be a more normalized uh, conversation around water conservation. Uh, you know, water conservation year round is an important thing to start promoting uh, just because it's, you know, we're out of the drought season for most regions. Um, you know, that doesn't mean it's a free for all, use water however you wish. Uh, we need to start encouraging and promoting water conservation in all aspects of, of our water use. And, and moving forward as well, systems need to be designed to be more resilient. Um, and again, not just to drought, but all other extreme weather impacts. Uh, you know, we're seeing significant flooding and freezing and extreme heat events all across the province. So, you know, are there ways to, to build or update our water systems so they are more resilient and robust to handle these changes in our weather patterns? So some things to consider when we're looking at the resilience building, you know, I'm going to be presenting short, mid and long range planning. And again, these are just some suggestions and, and ideas, but each water system is a little bit different and you would need to kind of see what's applicable to you and what would work for your system. But everybody needs to have a functional emergency response and contingency plan. And that's something that could be done um, you know, in the here and now, making sure that we've identified all those potential risks and that you have a plan to address them if, the, if you are exposed to them. Uh, again, like I said, big fan of communication. So communicating with the users and educating the users. So if the users understand the challenges that the water system faces, uh, you'll get more buy-in from the, them when you start asking them to be conservative with their water use. So keeping people in the loop, making them a part of the process is a really valuable exercise. And again, having those water conservation conversations. So promoting and encouraging that long-term uh, and continuous uh, change in attitudes around our water use. So some ideas around mid-range planning. Um, it's really important to understand uh, what the maximum capacity of the source is. So how much water is there available? You know, this can be limited by Perhaps if you have a water license, what's the maximum you're allowed to draw on that water license? It might be a maximum of what the source can supply. Uh, just by nature, what, what's the maximum that that supply can give you? 
Um, and that can help drive all sorts of conversations, not just around conservation, but you know, land development and densification conversations. We need to know how much water we have uh, and make sure that we don't try to expand past our maximum capacity. Uh, start formal water conservation planning. So is there things that you can do to formalize or to require or to have you know, plans in place around conservation and, and that response in conservation? Uh, water metering is also a very effective tool in looking at how much water is being used both at the source, so how much water are you pulling into the system, as well as the end users, so, you know, a meter at each service connection. Uh, so that that is really valuable information on a lot of different levels. You're understanding how much water is coming into the system. You're understanding, you know, what, how much those different users are taking out of that system. It's also really good at helping you understand water loss. So if you have the water coming in and you've got what's being used up at the meter, that unaccounted for number is what is leaking out of the system. So that can help you identify uh, your leak detection program because a lot of the systems are getting old and older and starting to leak. So we have systems that have some significant loss uh, through leaks. So you, know, you invest all this time and money and effort and then it just leaks out through the system. So having a good leak detection pro, uh, program and that asset management plan. So making sure that you identify the lifespan of those assets that you have within your drinking water system and making sure that they're, that planning is in place to, to replace them when, when they've reached the end of their operational life. So if you have the capacity within your water system to incentivize resilient design and water saving fixtures, that's uh, a really great route to take. I'm very cognizant that that's probably not, uh, you know, the, the reality for a lot of our really small water systems, but, you know, encouraging or incentivizing that resilient design is, is uh, a really great way to get the users uh, to be a little more conservative with their water use. Um, the opportunity for uh, community bylaws for new construction. So um, is there an opportunity to build new houses with the purple pipes? So if they want to start rainwater harvesting uh, and using some of that rainwater for toilet flushing or laundry, uh, that, that structure is already plumbed uh, with the capacity to do that. So encouraging sort of some of that design at the front end. And as well, you know, everybody has a voice and we can advocate for that higher level change in legislation. So, you know, looking at updating some of those building code requirements. And I know there's been some changes to the building code, uh, you know, around extreme heat. Um, so, you know, perhaps there's opportunities to look at, you know, how that uh, change, some of those changes to things like the plumbing and building code might be beneficial to, to look at water conservation. So with long range planning, uh, there's a couple of things that could be considered. Uh, there's the option of adding new sources of water and I put the caveat of maybe. And, and I say that because, you know, linking back to that, uh, that point about water loss, um, you know, there's an EPA document that uh, outlines that uh, a lot of water systems, if they were to plug their leaks in their system, they wouldn't need to add an additional source. And it's actually less expensive to address the leaks within the system than to develop a new source uh, to add to the system. So it's that balancing act and, and understanding those numbers. So you have to know how much you're losing in order to, to sort of make that determination, which goes back to that leak detection and asset management planning. So um, adding additional reservoir storage capacity. So if you don't already have a reservoir in your system, perhaps it's long-term consideration to, to build that uh, infrastructure in uh, to your system so that you have some additional storage capacity. And as well, if, if there's an emergency, there's a place for that water hauler to, to put that water uh, if, if your source does indeed run dry. We need to look at that long range population growth and the need. So what's what's the projected densification that's that's targeted for the area? Um, and what's the, the, the need going to be for that supply? Um, and also there's 
always a challenge around the funding of small water systems. So, you know, trying to establish a self-funding model uh, would be the gold standard. Uh, it's not always achievable, but, you know, definitely something that's worth working towards. So thank you very much. I thought I had another slide in there, but it seems to have disappeared. Let me pop back just really quickly here uh, because I did want to uh, share a few links. Nope, I guess not. All right. <laughs> So there are a few resources available online. The, the BEC government stroke portal has some really great information um, as well as uh, Island Health stroke web page where you can find that template as, as well as um, we did record a couple information videos. So just short uh, videos, uh, one for water suppliers and one for uh, water users, uh, talking about the challenges of drought and, and encouraging uh, conservation. So thank you very much uh, for your time. I'm looking forward to some questions. Thank you, Nancy. That was really informative presentation there. And I see that you've encompassed some short-term, medium-term, long-term planning in that presentation, which is fantastic for proactive approaches to uh, drought. Uh, yes, we're taking questions. If anybody has a question, um, please type it in the uh, questions uh, bar there um, for the GoToMeeting, and uh, we will try and answer your question for you. Okay, well, people are uh, thinking about questions there. Nancy, um, if indeed uh, uh, a water supplier has run out of water there, you have mentioned uh, EMCR as a group that could be contacted. Who is that group? So that's the Ministry of Emergency Response and Climate Readiness. So the old uh, emergency management. Um, so it's it's a bit tricky navigating that space so you know sort of the the support and level of support that they can provide uh, is really varied and so i, I don't want to speak too far out of sorts uh, around what they may or may not be able to support water systems with but uh, definitely worth the ask i know there's been some discussion around support if a water system were to run out of water it would be for domestic connections only, um, and there there may or may not be some monies available for the water, but maybe not the hauling costs. So I mean, it's it's always kind of changing. Um, but if if it's really an emergent issue, uh, definitely worth reaching out and and having that conversation um, to see what if any support uh, is is available. I in, in previous conversations I had with EMCR, it was um, made pretty clear that the expectation was that water systems be prepared. So the first question they might be asking is, did you follow your emergency response plan? Did you like what did you do to avoid this? This isn't like a safety net where you can just do nothing and expect uh, EMCR to come in and, and save the day. Um, but if you followed all your steps, say I'd had this plan, we've done this conservation methodology, you know, we've, you know, done all these other things and we've still run out of water. Uh, obviously then, you know, they're in a much better position to act. Um, but as I said, you know, definitely want to speak with them directly. Ah, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, we do have a question that's come in, and the question is, is are you aware of any current or future government programs to help private water suppliers update or improve infrastructure for small or very small systems? Unfortunately, no. Um, all the funding that I'm aware of is always linked to local government or First Nations. Um, there is very limited uh, funding opportunities for those private water supplies. So the stratas, the, the good neighbor systems. Um, so it really limits what you can do. And that's where that long range planning is really, really important because obviously you need to self fund all these activities yourself. So, you know, if you go, holy cow, we need a reservoir, everybody, you know, 
needs to start chipping in and saving now because it might be five years before you can afford to, to make that purchase. Um, you know, I don't know if the government is sort of evolving in their thought processes that perhaps we need to supply, you know, provide a little bit more support for those private water suppliers. Um, but uh, thus far, I'm not aware of, of any of those opportunities, although I'm always looking for them. Mm. We have another question here, and it says, where would you find information on aquifer monitors? I'm assuming those are observation wells. All right, so if we're talking about looking for what the province has for their uh, provincial monitoring wells, uh, it is on the BC Water Atlas mapping. So the, the province has mapping with all sorts of groundwater and surface water uh, information. Uh, I don't know the web address off the top of my head, but I'm sure if you Google BC Water Atlas, uh, that will come up. There's a lot of different layers in that mapping um, tool, and you can look at the provincial observation wells, I think is what they refer to them as, and they have wells, you know, all across BC, and the, they monitor what those aquifer levels are at. So you can, if you have a provincial monitoring well, which is perhaps nearby, and you look at the aquifer mapping, and you say, hey, we're on the same aquifer, you know, you can use that as a, as a tool. It's, it's not the be-all and end-all. Um, but it gives you an indication of, you know, is the water supply, you know, being really depleted? Is it being really challenged or is it, you know, at a, a normal level? In which case you could say, well, we're probably good. Uh, in the lack of all other information, you want to go with a really conservative model and make sure that you're implementing uh, water conservation strategies. We always encourage uh, water systems like our small water systems to sort of mirror what sort of the neighboring communities are doing. Because, you know, if, if they're sort of being challenged with their water supply, chances are yours is probably in a similar situation. Um, and as well, it also makes uh, communications a lot easier, right? So like, oh, well, you know, the community right beside us is at a level four water conservation strategy and you're at a level one. And, mm -hmm. you know, why, why is it so much worse across the street? And there's a lot of reasons why. It might be a completely different source. It could be a surface water versus a groundwater. It could also be the language. Water conservation levels, those water restriction levels, are not universal. Everybody comes up with their own. So some communities might have a one through four. One, some communities might have one through seven. So, um, you know, trying to understand and, and appreciate what the neighbors have and, you know, try to sort of mirror that makes a, they've already, you know, put in some of that legwork, but also makes communication and less confusion for the users. Mm, okay. Kind of went off on a tangent there, sorry. It's <laughs> okay. And uh, just to add to that, if you want further information on uh, your local aquifer monitoring, you may talk to a groundwater protection officer with Walrus who could assist you. Um, another question has come in, where would we find more information on rainwater harvesting and the use of purple pipes? So the, um, there's, I don't know if we have one be all and end all. There is a provincial guidance document for using uh, rainwater. Um, that document is more closely linked to if you want to use that as a potable water supply, which is an option, although somewhat onerous. Um, purple pipe is things uh, you could probably talk to a local plumber about. Um, you know, and again, there's just different uh, companies you would have to look at around. You know, sort of what what's locally available for for harvesting and collecting and storing that water, and what kind of capacity you'd want to have based on your your own usage. Um, the sort of low hanging fruit is is to use it for non potable applications, you know, watering your garden, uh, you know, washing your car with your rainwater. Uh, that way you can have some of that, but it doesn't need to be treated or disinfected to those potable water standards. If you, you do want to use it for potable water, it's, it's a much more onerous and challenging um, set of requirements that would need to be met. Thank you. 
Um, and just a reminder from the Online Help Center that we'll be posting this presentation on our website. Uh, we won't be sending the presentation to individuals who request it. They can uh, just jump into our website there and take a look at any one of the presentations from this year, including this one. If uh, this has piqued your interest and you want to share it with friends, you can just send them the link uh, to the Online Health Center there and they can actually uh, view this webinar once it's posted. All right, I'm just moving down through the questions here. Uh, what are the consequences of overuse of water licenses and how to prevent them from happening? So that's probably a much better question for uh, our friends at uh, Walrus, so, uh, because they're the ones that issue those water licenses. Obviously, you know, sort of that high level uh, understanding is there. there's only so much water. Um, and when they're issuing those licenses, they're allocating that water to the, essentially what the maximum level would be uh, while still allowing that uh, water system to function as its as its ecosystem. So, I mean, obviously there's fish and other, you know, aquatic life that needs to live. And, um, and it's very challenging because there's a lot of competing demands. Uh, you know, we have river systems that are fully allocated. Uh, you know, the, they have been clamping down on some illegal um, users on those river systems, but that those rivers still... Uh, are, are greatly depleted come summer. So, um, you know, we need to understand that the amount of water changes. It's it's not always static. And, and making sure that people are only taking what they need, not necessarily what they've been allocated, but what, what do you really need? And is there more efficient ways to use that water? So obviously, when we're talking about these things, I mean, our, our focus is on that domestic water supplies uh, and those potable water, uh, drinking water systems. There's a lot of other users on the system. And, um, you know, part of that conversation around water allocation is what do we value? And how uh, what is important in how we allocate that water? So, you know, when we're, we're looking at these shared resources, like what's the value of, of our agriculture um, industry, you know, in ensuring that we have food production that's happening locally. Um, you know, like what's the value of that to us as, as a society? Um, and ensuring that, you know, there is that adequate amount of water to, to do that, but we still need to make sure everybody has the water they need to thrive and survive in their, their, their homes. Um, it's, it's a very challenging conversation. Um, and this is where everybody needs to be looking at how they can be conservative with their water use. Is there more effective ways that they could be using that water? I know the Ministry of Agriculture had some funding available for farmers to, to uh, develop dugouts on their properties so they wouldn't have to use groundwater or river or other surface water supplies. Um, you know, there was funding opportunities for them to improve how they do irrigation. So rather than that large broadcast irrigation from the, the big guns, where, you know, perhaps a lot of it is evaporating or blowing away from where the crops are, having that uh, more direct drip irrigation uh, at the ground level, right where the root zones are. So, you know, there's a lot of different strategies for all the different users within, uh, within that little water system, that water, you know, watershed. Um, so it's it's really imperative that we all are part of those different conversations, so that you know there isn't that sort of finger pointing back and forth. Why why do they get water and and I can't? Um, so understanding where everyone else is coming from and trying to come to that consensus is a really valuable exercise. I do have another question here. It's actually a three part question, so I'm going to summarize it somewhat just for for ease here and. Uh, uh, do the health authorities collaborate with other provincial authorities such as MBC and EMBC on critical infrastructure and resource identification and planning? So uh, the health authorities uh, do collaborate with other agencies. I know within Island Health, we do work quite closely with our MBC partners. Um, 
there's actually a tabletop exercise going on uh, right now uh, for what happens if one of our hospital sites runs out of water. Uh, so interesting timing on that tabletop exercise that's happening within our organization. Um, obviously, we do collaborate at the provincial level, so other, you know, all the health authorities get together and, and have some of these conversations about, you know, what each of us are doing and how we can work together and how we can collaborate and, and nudge other um, government ministries, uh, you know, to, to support and continue on the work that we're doing. Um, I am heartened. I mean, I've worked in government for a long time and I'm happy to say that there's definitely a, a change in that attitude and willingness for other ministries to work together a lot more than I've seen in the past. So, uh, you know, that's a really positive thing. And I think that's going to support us moving forward as we look at all these different issues. Very good. Thank you. Uh, another question has just come in and it says, is there data on aquifer levels during the 2021 heat wave? That's a good question. Those provincial monitoring wells have been in place for many, many years. Um, although I don't know, because I've never played in those layers, how far back you can go and look at that data. And if it's something that you can look at year over year um, or how to function that within that mapping system, um, that data would be available. Uh, somewhere and if it's not within that mapping function again I think that suggestion you had Rob to talk to one of the water officers would be really really valuable uh, because if it's not easily accessible within that mapping tool uh, the 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 drinking water or the groundwater officers I always get their titles incorrect um, probably would be able to access that information Oh, good, thank you. Uh, we do have another question here. Uh, did you have the opportunity to go back to the water supplier with the reservoirs on the Forest Service Road and see how they changed their ERCP? That's a really good question. I think what um, <laughs> uh, I did actually move out of my field position shortly after, um, so I really should go back and knock on that door and ask um, benefit that that water system had is they had four reservoirs so they did have a lot of capacity that they weren't using they had two reservoirs that were typically offline so if I were to guess I suspect they probably tried to cycle in the four reservoirs so that they had more capacity um, but there was no way that water hauler was getting up that hill so they probably would have had to build another reservoir or have a temporary reservoir tank installed because that truck was not getting up that hill. Mm, yeah, that's, uh, that's always, always interesting there to see how the ERCPs are exercised. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, you need to you know have a common sense approach to an ERCP, but it definitely has to be workable. So you should exercise and see basically how it, how it works. Um, another question here. Uh, and this is with regards to priority of licenses, I'm assuming, but it says who has priority for water intro conditions, ranchers for their hay fields or small residential communities? So again, that is, is governed under Walrus's uh, legislation. Um, my understanding of that was uh, typically the licenses uh, our, the priority in license is that first in time, first in right. So that fit for methodology where uh, whoever held the license the longest has the, long, the longest standing access to that. So obviously that, that can create some challenges if there's scarcity and there's a domestic user uh, that's got a, a lower priority than say an agricultural or industrial user. Uh, obviously, uh, in public health, we, we advocate uh, for the, those people sources. So, um, you know, it, the methods of how they would uh, pull back license or restrict water usage on existing license, um, I believe typically they would probably start cutting back on those agricultural and industrial water licenses uh, to try to make sure that there's enough water for everybody. 
Um, but again, that's uh, that would fall under the walruses legislation. So again, really maybe a, a great conversation for a future webinar is, is having uh, you know, someone from Walrus come and speak to some of those licensing uh, issues. Priority of licensing, yeah, that is a great recommendation. We'll reach out to Walrus to uh, see whether they can uh, provide a webinar for us. And I do have a question here. Um, is there work to regulate private well usage during trout events? Can you say that again? Is there a, a... Is there work to regulate private well usage during drought events? Oh, so the ones that aren't permitted. Yeah, and I again, so. that's, that's that multiplicity of users within the watershed. We only, as, as all the water system operators know, we regulate those two or more connections or that single public connection. So all those individual wells, um, don't fall under our legislation. And same with under uh, Walrus's Groundwater Protection Act. Uh, their licensing, again, is, is for those uh, agricultural or non-domestic uses. So if you have a well and it's domestic use uh, below a certain, you know, reasonable level, um, they're not licensed, which also means they're not monitored and their, their water usage is, is, not, is not known. It's, it's a real wild card when we're looking at the availability of water um, and sort of that allocation piece. So it, it's definitely a gap. Um, I don't know if, if there's any appetite within the government to start looking at that in, in a more uh, holistic and wholesome way uh, to, to try to determine how many wells are out there and what kind of usage and drawdown are we getting from those individual private wells? Um, and, and do they need to be monitored or regulated or, or, or what? I don't know if, if that is something that's sort of on the government's radar, uh, but definitely acknowledge that is the big black hole of the unknown. We don't know. Uh, and therefore, we, it's just, we can only speak to what we know and that's we acknowledge that that's a gap in data and a gap in information but definitely a significant use of of that water mm. yeah yeah definitely um we do have another question here any idea what the level of confidence is in predicting drought for bc well i mean we can make correlations when we look at what the projections are in our weather patterns. So when we look at sort of those climate impacts, uh, you know, we know that, you know, we're, we're expecting to see that, you know, multiple degree increase overall in, in our weather. So, you know, our summers are going to be hotter uh, longer. So uh, that correlation means, you know, it's hotter, people tend to to be using a little bit more water for all those different uses because everything is so hot and dry. Um, you know, when we look at the coastal regions, we we also, you know, people are like, oh yeah, but they're saying on the coast that we're gonna be getting a whole lot more rain. But the challenge is that rain is gonna come in very short episodes, uh, typically tied to significant storm events. So uh, it doesn't have that time to percolate into the soil, back down into the aquifer. And that's assuming that the ground's not frozen because, I mean, I know I checked the drought ratings uh, this morning. Um, the, the provincial technical drought working groups stopped meeting there at the end of October and uh, the East Peace region was still at a level four drought. Um, and Fort Nelson and the upper Fraser West were finished the year out at drought level three. Well, that drought didn't end. They're still in a drought. Um, and the challenge for those areas is that ground is, if it's not already frozen, it's going to be frozen really soon. So any additional precipitation just superficially travels and goes away. It doesn't have that opportunity to trickle into, into the ground to recharge those aquifers. Um, you know, we don't have like that sort of simplistic uh, projection like, oh yeah, we're going to have this many more days of, of drought. Uh, but we, you know, if we look at things as a correlation, you know, we know that we're going to have more hot days in a year. 
Uh, so we can just sort of assume that drought is going to continue to be an issue for a lot of our, our communities. Mm. Uh, next question uh, is, and this may actually be related to uh, uh, water licensing division within government, but uh, would there be an emergency approval of a new water source not water hauling related? So if you wanted, if you were in an absolute pickle and you were, your source was dry, um, you know, you have to have that conversation with your drinking water officer. Uh, you know, obviously not having water is a public health emergency. So, you know, I know as a health inspector, we're going to bend over backwards to do everything we can to support the water system in getting back up and, and running. And that might mean bringing it online in the capacity of a, a boil water advisory um, or, uh, you know, even depending on the source, a, a do not drink. So at least they have water for toilet flushing um, and maybe they have bottled water for, uh, you know, drinking and cooking. Uh, you know, there there is things that we can do. Obviously, we don't like doing that because the risks are really hard to quantify in those short periods of time. So that's where that planning piece comes into play. So if you know there's another source that you potentially could tap into, start having those conversations now. Like if there's a, a well that maybe hasn't been used, you know, talk to your drinking water officer. Say, hey, if I wanted to bring this thing online in the summer, what would I need to do? So, you know, that way you can get some of that testing done ahead of time. You can get some of those, you know, risks and assessments done uh, so that, you know, if and when you need to bring it online, it's just like, hey, I'm ready to bring it online. You do a couple back T tests and then, you know, you're good to go. But that's that planning piece. Uh, it'll save you a lot of headache down the road. But in an emergency, we'll figure it out. But you need to loop in the drinking water officer. Don't just drop a pipe in the creek and call her good and, you know, forget to mention it because that never goes over well with those not fun health inspector types. <laughs> yeah, and I'd also encourage water suppliers to reach out to Walrus also to talk about the emergency use of uh, local sources for water. Uh, there is a water licensing component to yes. all water extraction that uh, needs to go through some form of provincial approvals there. So it's good to understand what the process is and have that conversation well in advance. Um, that appears to be all of our questions there, Nancy, and I really want to thank you for a really engaging conversation today. I think it's pertinent uh, to what we're seeing out there. We're seeing drought more frequently, and uh, many of the water suppliers in the province have struggled with low water levels, and uh, planning ahead is, is always one of the best strategies that we can have. So thank you very much. As I mentioned earlier, the webinar will be posted on our website and people can view this webinar at any time. For your ESCP certified operators, uh, you will receive a certificate for completion of this webinar. You can submit that to ESCP for your CEU credits. Thank you for attending today and uh, we wish you all the, well, all the best out there. Thank you. <laughs>